circulate the recording um, afterwards um, and we'll circulate the slides as well. Yeah, so the slides and the recording and any of the resources that we speak that I speak to tonight will be um, on the website, on the Fighting Chance website, fully accessible, um, uh, which is really good. And Ali is here. Ali's from Fighting Chance as well, um, from the marketing team, and she's going to be managing the chat. Uh, so we'll stop throughout. Um, so if you want to put any questions in the chat, totally fine. Um, and yeah, we will get started. So before um, we start, I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. So, and this is a bit tricky, I need to work out where. So what is evidence in the context of NDIS? Um, and this is where I thought I'd start because it's sort of like, oh, you need to provide evidence, whether it's for access or for a first plan or for a 10th plan, um, you need to provide evidence. Um, so evidence in the NDIS context is dependent on the support being requested and the functional impact that the participant is experiencing. So um, being that NDIS is an insurance scheme, they're so reliant on us providing sufficient and appropriate evidence. So we need to think about what we want to achieve, like what support are we, are we asking for? Um, and then going, okay, well, which, uh, which clinician or which provider or what can we provide to um, show that, to provide that, that evidence? And that might be most appropriately provided by a clinician or a couple of clinicians or it might be a combination of um, school or um, uh, incident reports um, or a carer statement, um, clinical letters from OT, physio, psychologist. Um, there's lots of there's lots of forms of um, evidence, I guess. So I think it's really important to think, what's the purpose of this? What are we trying to achieve out of it? And making sure that that's stuck to the whole time. Um, so th um, the purpose of providing is to support the individual re with receiving appropriate funded supports in their plan so they can build capacity and reach their goals. That's essentially, it's a capacity building scheme. Um, and so even though there are some people where um, it's not so much about capacity but not losing capacity or um, it might be about showing about maintaining that level of function um, so it could it might not be if, if for that individual that building capacity is needed but it's about reaching their goals um, supporting them to in the best way possible um, uh, and so providing sufficient evidence is going to work towards that. It's going to show the NDIA that this support is needed. Um, and with this support, it's going to achieve or the idea is that it achieves A, B and C. And that links back then to um, where those functional impacts are, where those deficits are um, and those challenges are um, and how can we fill those gaps in a way? What supports can NDIA put in Put in place um, to that are appropriate um, to help to to fill those things and build that capacity so that person can achieve their goals. Um, so when approaching a clinician for a report, I think this is right from the start, whether you're a support coordinator, a family or a participant, um, if you're going to a clinician and saying that you want a report, it's really important to be clear on what the letter um, or report you are asking for um, is. So is it an end of summary plan report that's been requested by the NDIA? Is it a functional report that's been requested by the NDIA? NDIA? Or have you spoken to another clinician who has, or another provider who has recommended that an assessment be done to gather more information in a certain area? So an example of this would be if someone is um, wanting to explore housing options, then um, getting a OT functional uh, for housing purposes um, to, uh, to identify and explore those options and put it into a um, clinical assessment report so the NDIA can consider that 
funding or if the person has had a decline in their cognitive functioning then um then potentially a neuropsychological assessment report is needed or necessary to really show the NDIA um comprehensively that there has been a decline and there needs to be additional supports put in place be clear on the purpose or the reason which I just covered um and be clear on the outcome that you're hoping for and the areas that you want the clinician to focus on. So there's lots of different areas. Um, the NDIA are mainly focused in, in there's six uh, specific areas that they're mainly focused on, uh, which we'll cover shortly. But um, you want to make sure that if there has been a decline in a certain area, then that is noted, then that is spoken about. So what has prompted these changes? What has prompted this, um, this support? that or outcome that you're wanting then if there's a reason for it that needs to be explained to the clinician so they can they can then understand whether what it is you're asking for and whether they are able to support um so there's there's lots of different reports out there and so and because of the limited time I've just sort of picked on two um quite broadly as well just so it covers uh, just so it can cover um, as much as I can. So what's the NDIS looking for in an assessment report? Um, so an assessment report, just so you're aware, is it's typically re requested in response to a change of situation, a transition period, or if not enough evidence has previously been provided. So um, if, if, for example, I've supported um, uh, I've had people who I've supported on to, um, through access and onto um, the NDIS and they've got their first planning meeting, um, but we've got them on access with just a diagnosis letter. So it's just said in medical language what they're diagnosed with. And it's a, um, it's a, a di like, a, it's a, disability that's on one of the lists that doesn't require any additional supporting evidence. But when they get to the next stage of getting their first plan, um, the plan typically isn't funded for anyone correctly on the first plan. And so, um, and one of the first things that a lot of people ask or a lot of planners or a lot of LACs will ask the individual to get is say that they've put in funding for a functional assessment report, uh, typically an OT, but it can also be other functional reports, whether it be a physiopsychologist, neuropsychologist or speech therapist. Um, so essentially, uh, by being able to provide um, enough evidence um, and being able to demonstrate the significant functional impact, hopefully that will result in um, appropriate supports being funded. So uh, in an assessment report, um, it really is, it is, it's really um, hard as well, and this just to be noted in that for families, for participants and for clinicians, we're not used to writing in a deficit with deficit based language, but unfortunately NDIA, are, uh, it's a deficit based scheme, it's an insurance scheme, um, and they really need to hear the deficits or the challenges. Being open with the um, participant and explaining that to them is really good to say that this is how this report is written um, before read before they read it how this report is written it's written for the NDIA it is deficit based it is hard to read but this is not taking away from all the great things that you're able to do and all the strengths and superpowers that you have um, so clearly identify the deficits um, referring to the six domains so the six domains being mobility, communication, learning, social interaction, self-care and self-management. And we're going to go into it in quite a bit of detail. Some people have said to me, oh, no, you only need it for access. It's not true. Um, so when a person is so when a person has a meeting with their LAC or their planner, the LAC or planner ha ha has their own system that they need to go through and put together their own report based on the conversation and the supporting evidence. Part of that report, whether it's their first plan or their fifth plan, is that they um, 
have to speak to those six domains. So they have to take the information that they've gathered from the reports and everything and put it into those six areas. If you have written a report that reflects on those six areas and you can have them as subheadings or you don't have to, but if you can do that and clearly outline the functional impact in those areas, um, then that's going to help a lot because um, it's going to mean that you have a bit more control then of what they use in the certain areas. I know that for I know for a fact that so many people will look through a report, LACs and planners, and they will look in those areas. And if there is clearly sort of information on mobility or information on communication, then they will just copy and paste it. And so um, it sort of it does a lot by doing that. Um, other things that they are um looking for is they're looking for the impact on um, the person, social and community participation, their employment or um, their study, depending on where they're at. Um, now, this might not be, employment or study might not be relevant to, to the individual and that's okay, but so uh, social and community participation for most ages, most dis disabilities, it is relevant. So at least um, uh, commenting there um, with the six domains as well if there's a if there's a domain that absolutely does not impact the person don't need to comment or don't need to write anything um, but I do find a lot of them intertwine especially if someone has difficulty with communication um, and with social interaction um, I find that a lot of the other ones uh, are, are impacted and we'll talk about that in a minute and this is a really hard um, way to do it, but it's actually quite a powerful thing um, through the report, including if if it's relevant and um, and if it really shows comparison to typical. So information um, that you gather clearly sort of um, can show the deficits between or the differences between a person who is typically developing. Um, and a person and that individual uh, and it's horrible it is a horrible thing to write and a horrible thing to read um, but the NDIA it really paints a clear picture and sort of slaps them in the face being like um, yes we can see that there's a difference here and the difference is a, a direct result of the individual's disability and that is the NDIA's responsibility to fund. Um, you want to um, make sure that there is a connection through the report. So when you start, you want your um, reason for assessment, uh, your background, um, your clinical sort of reasoning for, uh, with your functioning. Um, so the, the, um, the assessment tools that you've used and a summary of those, um, you want to uh, have the six domains covered in there, whether you cover it within or additional. And then you want the summary of the whole picture. And down the bottom, you want your recommendations, but you want your recommendations to link back to the rest. So essentially, as you read down, as the plan or LAC reads down the report, they're building a better picture, a better picture, a better picture. And then they get to the recommendations and they're like, oh yeah, that makes complete sense because this is what, uh, because I've understood the picture of the person. Um, if we're not explaining using functional language and if we're not explaining um, uh, the the impact of the disability that they've met access for, um, then when it comes to the recommendations, it's going to feel disjointed to the planner or to the LAC and it's not going to make any sense, which means the funding is way less, like it's not likely that it's going to be funded. doesn't matter how many hours the, rec the report says, um, they will base it on their own reasonable and necessary justification. Um, it also is important to note that the... Uh, recommendations um, must have a reasonable and necessary justification in there for each of them, not a broad overall reasonable and necessary justification, but each, um, each recommendation. So if you're recommending OT, 
speech physio support workers a low cost AT, there needs to be a justification next to each. And I know that can be time consuming, but it does get easier to write them um, once you get into the swing of it. So uh, making sure that you're linking back to each of those points. And I've got a link um, and we'll link it to the website as well for um, reasonable and necessary. Also for the rules, the NDIS rules, which is really helpful. Um, and for uh, NDIA versus mainstream, which is helpful as well. And I just want to quickly add one more thing with that is that if you're um, putting mainstream recommendations in your in your NDIS assessment report, which you absolutely can, um, I would really recommend though that you separate it. So you separate it and have a heading for mainstream recommendations or mainstream and community recommendations, and then for NDIS recommendations, because it shows the NDIA that you, the supports that you are recommending are in line with NDIS legislation and are most appropriately funded by the NDIS. Um, so that's, and then in a summary report, which is um, the other report that I was that I'll focus on today um, is typically asked for. Well, actually, it's asked for um, uh, by any person, any provider that um, clinical provider that uses um, NDIS funding needs to provide a summary report at the end of the plan. This can be, so I've had a bit of a mixed messages here when it comes to people who are just rolling over their plan. Um, so some LACs will say, no, nah, don't worry about it. And others will say, no, we need the reports. Um, and so it's just about at that, um, when you decide if you just want a rollover of the plan or if the participant just wants a rollover of their plan, to just check in and say, is a summary report needed? Um, and, and then you can provide that if it is. So with a summary report, you want to make sure that um, the it's clearly outlined what you what's been worked on through the year, what's been working well and not working well. Um, identify the progress of clinical goals. So we we know, and the NDIA recognizes as well that the NDIS goals. Um, or the goals in a person's NDIS plan typically are quite broad. And they're broad for the reason that there's a lot more flexibility to utilise the funding in different ways when it is kept broad. So it is better that it is a broad goal. But when someone comes to you as a participant or a client and they say, um, I want to, like, I want to work with on skill building and then you say what do you want to work on and then they give you the NDIS goals and they're super broad then you'd be like okay well I, we need to kind of break this down a little bit because um, there are a lot of steps to be able to achieve this so the NDIA recognize that there are going to be those clinical goals or those smaller goals um, and it's important to speak to the progress of those um, but make sure that they're linked back to the NDIS goals. So then when it comes to the next steps and recommendations, it makes sense to the NDIA that you're still working on these same goals, but we're just you're just taking the next step. Um, hours and costing can be included in the, in the um, uh, summary report, or it can be included by attaching a quote to it. Completely up to you. Um, just so you know, though, that it is a guide for the NDIA and it's not a guarantee. It never is. Um, and it's still, you need to still put the reasonable and necessary justifications um, in your recommendations in a summary report because um, uh, that they are reliant on that and the information that's been provided. So... Um, as, so if you're a support coordinator or a participant or a family member, um, Ali, if there's um, questions in the chat and you want me to stop, just say, otherwise I'll just keep going. No, I think we're all good so far. Um, Tracy was asking if we can circulate a, a template report, which um, I think we absolutely can do as part of the resources yeah. afterwards. Yeah, we um, can. So, yeah, um, fantastic. Yeah, we can do. So um, it's just a guide. Um, uh, as I said at the beginning, and um, some people have come in late, but I'll just repeat it. Um, I, I do work as a um, support coordinator now. I do have a clinical background um, as an occupational therapist, but I'm not practicing as an occupational therapist. Um, and so obviously take it, like take this as 
Um, so how I sort of have this understanding is I've done a lot of work with the NDIA over the years in different roles and I have the clinical background. So I've been to some degree being able to understand both sides and then sort of communicate that, I guess. Um, and, uh, but like we can, I can definitely um, uh, provide a template, uh, but it would be more like it's definitely you guys choose how you want to use it, how you want to use this information. Um, but this is, yeah, this is from my experience, from my knowledge and and I was working at the NDIS um, or at the NDIA, uh, how their systems run. Um, and also mainly based on the outcomes that I have seen over the years and what's been working well and what hasn't and the response from the clinicians as well. So never, um, and um, I am probably repeating myself here, but never do I, when as a support coordinator, will I speak to someone's clinical reasoning or comment on the way someone does um, an assessment or anything like that. It's not about their performance as a clinician. Um, when I read a report and as a support coordinator or a participant or a family member, the thing to remember when, re when reading a clinical report um, is really focusing on are we, um, are we li linking to the, um, the functional language um, that the NDIS requires? So when so an example of that is if, if it's just stated that someone can't do something, but it's not explained or backed up by assessment tools, then the NDIA aren't going to have a comprehensive or understanding or picture of what the functioning is of the individual. If, if medical language is used, um, or even just sort of language that clinicians understand, but the people at the NDIA absolutely do not. Um, a big one is that I see all the time is people say, um, person has poor executive functioning. And it's like, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? Can you give any examples? And how have you, how, how is that, um, like how have you assessed that um and so by breaking that down and use it and that's what the ndia are looking for so when i say NDIS language ndis language that's what i mean by breaking it down by explaining the functional impact and painting a better picture um so that's what i'm looking for when i read a report and also i'm looking for in recommendations that it links to reasonable and necessary and it's touching on all of the reasonable and necessary points um, the other thing that I um, am looking for, and I will um, say this at the end, um, and I was talking to Ali about this this morning, is um, the golden thread. So not just through the through that report, but also through all the reports, is that there is a it makes sense. It makes sense through the report. Like it, you're talking about the same person. It's not disjointed. By the time that the person get that the LAC or planner gets to the um, recommendations they're like oh yeah totally get it like it it makes sense because you've explained it really well and you've assessed to build on that so to back up what you're saying so if you're saying someone can't do something explain that and then back it up with supporting evidence back it up with uh, sorry back it up with ev um uh, assessment tools standardize or non standardize it's okay um it is good to have a mix throughout but um yeah so um they're the, they're the main things that um that I'm looking for. So it's always good to request a draft report from the clinician um, to give the opportunity to read through and suggest any changes. Some clinicians, as part of their service or as part of their assessment report, they will offer um, a feedback session, which I think is so fantastic. Uh, and I would encourage taking that uh, because it gives you an opportunity to talk through the report with the clinician, talk through the results of the report and what it means uh, because um, assessment reports tend to be quite long um, and it can be quite confronting to read. So just keeping that in mind, it's not written for just everyday sort of family members to read. It's written for clinicians. It's written for the NDIA. Um, so it's essentially written to get funding. Um, making sure that recommendations, as I said, meet reasonable and necessary criteria. 
Um, if it doesn't, then providing that feedback to the clinician so an updated um, justification can be written. Um, the clinician may require support to understand how to write justification or how to um, word using NDIS language. So um, the like some of the resources that will be attached and everything can be helpful, um, especially with the justification linking them back to um, NDIS legislation section 34. Uh, an appropriate NDIS language would be speaking functionally, not, not medically, and explaining what the um, difficulties and challenges look like for that individual. When we receive a report or a letter, we must read and provide feedback. Um, so, and I say this because it seems pretty obvious, but um, there's a lot of support coordinators that um, uh, that I've heard say, um, oh, well, they the clinician wrote a crap report. And it's taking absolutely no responsibility. And it's like, well, no, if they've if they've written a report that's not in line with NDIS, then it's our role to provide that feedback. Um, and so that can be adjusted and changed before sending it to the NDIA. Um, every clinician that I've spoken to has not had an issue with it. Um, it's not about rewriting the report. It's not about doing anything that is... Um, uh, it's not about doing anything that is speaking to them as a clinician. Um, it's really just focusing on the NDIS side. Um, so the six domains, why is it important to understand the six domains? And I'm going to harp on about this for a little bit now because um, there is a lot of importance in it. Um, so understanding the domains and what the NDIS is looking for in a report is important to help with guiding the clinicians um, when providing feedback. So if you're a family member or a support coordinator, um, it gives you something to look out for. So has through that report in the functional section, so not the recommendation section, in the functional section of the report, the main part of the report, um, uh, have they touched on each of the domains? Some clinicians might like to do subheadings, some don't. And it's fine either way, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, some, yes, as I said before, some people think it's just relevant in access, but it's actually not. Um, it's relevant with every assessment report. It's not relevant for summary reports. Um, and so it's important that the clinician remains within their scope, um, but assesses and reports in all of the functional domains um, as much as they can and as much as what impacts that individual. So you can't make something up. So if they're not impacted in an area, then you're not going to write about it. But um, there is um, there is a, um, ang like a perspective or an angle that you can go off on most of the, um, uh, the on all of the domains really, because they're, they're so much intertwined. So if someone has, um, like difficulties with um, with leaving the house or with isolation and stuff. That's actually information that can be put in mobility. Um, so people think mobility is just um, like use of limbs and stuff. It's absolutely not. So if they have difficulty with um, leaving the house because uh, of sort of uh, impacts of medication um, or impacts of um, uh of their ability to sort of navigate or communicate or read a map, um, then and uh, then that would be mobility um, because that's stopping them from from accessing the community. Um, so yeah, so there there are different angles that you can take, but you can still definitely talk to those domains. Um, so I'm going to share something that's going to help a little bit. I think with. I've just stopped sharing for a sec. I'm just going to pull it up and then share my screen again. Hopefully this works. So um, this is uh, um, 
it says up here prop for an access request form, but I just feel like it shows, it gives a good um, example uh, of what I'm talking about when it comes to medical language and then functional impact, which is what we want to focus on when it comes to NDIS and then the support. So how it links all together. So in the domain of mobility, this is, um, the, this is probably what you'd hear from a medical report, that these are the symptoms but you wouldn't have any functional impact or the, the um, they wouldn't explain what that means to that person um, or how that impacts that person. So this would be medical. The symptoms would be what you would see in a medical report and what you would hear from the doctor. What we want to focus on as a clinician or as if we're reading um, a, as a support coordinator or as a family member is we want to make sure that the report is um, giving examples of the functional impact like these examples in the middle here. Um, and then uh, how, so if someone's commenting on these things, some of the, so here's some examples of the support that could be considered by NDIS. So in the recommendations, some of the supports that might be um, uh, considered. So it's linking together. So it's linking between the functional impact um, and the and then the supports make sense because you've spoken about those areas. Um, and I think it's also really important to then go back to um, making sure and everyone sort of assesses differently. So if you're at the start of your, um, like if you're meeting the person for the first time and you're doing an initial um, and you're asking them the purpose of the assessment and um, what they're wanting to get out of it, where, where the decline's been or what the issues are or challenges are for the individual, then that's going to give you some ideas of what assessment tools to, to use. Um, and where to focus the, the information that you gather on. Um, and then understanding what support, so you can work that way or you can work with going, okay, what support are you looking for? Okay, well, I'm looking for um, in, living independently. So I want to live in a, in a SIL home or in a, like, I, I think that SIL is most appropriate for me, you might hear. Um, and then as an OT, you would need to assess all the options. Um, but that's the support that you are that you are being asked for. That's the purpose of the assessment. So when you're looking at the functional impact, and you're looking at the assessment tools being used, you need to make sure that you're covering all of the areas and it's backing up what you're saying. Um, there's no point in um, there's no point in uh, speaking to making recommendations when you haven't commented on the functional side or you've just listed a whole lot of symptoms. Uh, the NDIA are, are really not going to care about that and it's not going to get very far. Um, so I'm going to go back to the slides. Uh... While you're um, going back to the slides, um, it might be a good moment just to Rando made a comment in the chat. Um, he said, um, talk about whiplash. Earlier today in the mental health space, I was told I was being too focused on my deficits when discussing my goals. Um, so I guess maybe that's kind of context specific or depends on kind of the outcome that you're you're trying to achieve. I think it does. And I think there's another thing to, to be conscious of is that there, and it's tricky, Rando. So there has to be, there needs to be a little bit of a balance with, um, sorry, there needs to be a little bit of a balance with um, making sure that there's a balance between the progress. And so if it's a, if it's a review, um, so you've been using NDIS funding, and then you come to the end, and you're asking for more, there needs to be that balance between um, you kind of, you need to make sure that they know that the supports that you're getting is working and you want them to continue. Um, and so, but still saying that there's a lot of room to improve. So there's still deficits or difficulties there and challenges there, but it's balanced with um, these things are working well, but the risk of, if they were taken away, the risk would be A, B, and C, that the um, there would be a decline and so that's one part and the second part is we're here um, and continued support will mean that we can get to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage um, so it's not it's not appropriate to 
stop the supports now. Um, so there, there has to be a little bit of a balance. And obviously, I don't know the context of um, the conversation that you had today. But um, I do find that there, there, there does need to be that balance when it comes to um, a reassessment meeting, um, because they want to see that um, the support that they're funding is being funded appropriately, but they also need to see and need to hear that um, through the reports and through like speaking and the conversation um, that the support is required to continue. Otherwise, um, there will be a decline or there's a big risk of decline um, or um, or if the if the supports are stopped too early, um, that the sort of it won't be effective because you're only at this point and you need to be at this point to be able to do something independently. So it need there needs to be a bit of a balance there, but it is a good point because um, the NDIA can be so frustrating uh, and very much, which makes this really hard, is that. Uh, it does depend on who you get as well. So like it's supposed to be a national scheme. Everyone's supposed to do the same thing. They don't. We know they don't. Um, and so uh, clear things that you can link to or latch on to um, is using the like making sure it links to legislation or make, making sure it links to things that they are guided by, which is which is mainly the legislation. So um yeah, I think there needs to be a little bit of a balance there. But um, saying when something isn't working is really important and explaining what that looks like and how that impact, how that links back to the disability you've met access for. Um, and then also um, why the supports are needed. Uh, but something you could do as well is you, if if they're saying that you're being too, too sort of deficit-based or you know, talking too much about your challenges, which seems really odd. But anyway, um, they do odd things. They say odd things. But if they are saying something like that and they are kind of saying, oh, okay, well, this support isn't working, um, you can say, no, it has or it's been shown to and get the clinician to link it back to um, evidence-based research. Um, so that can, that uh, can also be really powerful. So um, there are a couple of ways, but that's really annoying. And um, sorry to tell you all of this when you had that experience today. Um, so I'm just going to give a couple of examples of what I mean. And I, um, uh, so this is sort of the typical language that that is often seen in reports. Um, so person A has a diagnosis of cerebral palsy and does not have any control over their limbs, over any of their limbs. So we can see there that you're sort of naming what's that that thing. It's there's a challenge there, but the NGIA aren't getting a big big picture. Um, so an example would be sort of explaining it like they have a diagnosis. Um, which has significant impact on their mobility and requires a lot of support to be safe, able to safely move around in the home and or access the community. For example, so you're stating that they are unable to do something. You're given it, giving an example um, of what that looks like, and then you're saying what like uh, the risk if um, if there's no support. So in the um, big chunk of the assessment report so the functional bit or the yeah the main part of the report so not the intro and not the summary or recommendations but where they're talking about assessment tools and where they're going into these areas um you don't want to be talking about recommendations uh it becomes really confusing so some people like to do it some people like to put tables in and everything like that and and it's definitely obviously your choice um, and preference but what I find um, with the NDIA so much of the time is that they get so confused so we're talking to people or we're often having to justify a case to people who aren't clinically trained who don't have a very good understanding um, in the disability space and are really disconnected and so we need to really spell it out to them in the simplest way possible um, and really like just because sometimes you get something back and you're like how do you not know that but they just don't we need to expect they know nothing and um 
uh, and provide as much evidence as we can. Um, and then so if we're explaining this bit in the middle bit of the report, then when we get to the recommendations, it makes more sense. If we're putting the recommendations through the report and then at the end, the LACL planner gets super confused with what the person's being, uh, what the clinician is asking for. So um, I do, re I do, um, this is just an example of what it would, what um, a statement could look like instead of just you know, stating the person has a challenge, uh, but explaining it. And I've done it for each of them. Um, so communication, this might be what you um, see in a report, but this is sort of an example of um, using functional language to explain wh what it looks like and how it impacts the individual. Um, you guys will have access to, to these ones, uh, to this as well. So um, I'll just... Uh, keep it up so you can read or take a photo or um, look at it later. But um, yeah, this is obviously in each of the sections as well, there's lots of things that you can talk about. So each statement that you make, there needs to be, you need to back it up. So if you think about it like that, if you're talking, if you're saying that a person can't do something, you need to back it up either with an assessment tool or with a, um, a uh, like if if like if one of the if a family member or has informed you or giving you that information, giving an example that way or something you've observed, um, but backing backing it up, uh, and so I like so you say um has a diagnosis of Down syndrome, moderate intellectual disability, they have sleep apnea, um, and pulmonary hypertension, which affects their physical stamina and causes increased susceptibility to respiratory illness. So this is an interesting one as well. Um, and I probably, like, I just want to stick on this for a sec because um, there's also a real importance with um, making sure that uh, when you're um, speaking to um the functioning of the individual, whether it's their cognitive functioning or whether that's their overall functioning or whether that's their functioning in a certain area, you need to be thinking about it from the perspective of what disability have they met access for? And I really recommend you asking that to asking the family, asking the participant, asking the support coordinator. If you're a clinician and you're about to write, um, do an assessment, ask that question because what they've been diagnosed with and what they've met access for to the NDIS can be very different. And if you're talking about all these things that they have been diagnosed with and you're assessing all of these things that they've been diagnosed with, but they haven't met access for it, then it's actually going to make the report completely irrelevant. Um, so that's it's so important to focus on that so in this case and you can see there's some health conditions here but that doesn't mean that you can't use that to to comment in the person's area of self-care because it is relevant their health conditions but how you want to word it in the assessment report is how does their down syndrome which um has resulted in a moderate intellectual disability. How has that, um, how does that impact on their ability to independently manage their sleep apne apnea and pulmonary hypertension? Um, so if they're unable to manage those health conditions due to their disability, then that's an angle that you can very strongly justify an increase in support, um, whether it's an increase in health support or whether it's an increase in other supports, um, uh, like physical support or, or equipment or whatever, um, uh, you, if you're, if you can explain that really clearly, then when you come to the recommendations, it will actually be quite easier to write the justifications if you've written the middle part quite well, because um, you're able to, yeah, it just flows so much nicer, and you're able to sort of summarize it really easily. Um, and so, and then this one I'll just touch on as well in that. Um, 
so a per, so with NDIS, um, there are so if someone has been diagnosed with a mental illness um, through health, and they um, and it's a it's a sort of a um, a known mental illness, not like the they're being told that they're crazy or something that's not in the DSM they that doesn't exist but if they're being told that they have a diagnose they've been diagnosed with schizophrenia and it's been for say 10 years um and they've had all the treatments but there's still the the functional impact so with schizophrenia there's it's quite easy to sort of explain because there's the positive symptoms the negative symptoms and the cognitive impairment and I won't go into this too much but the positive symptoms tend to be managed well by health that's the hallucinations delusions and those like added things that you get with schizophrenia the negative symptoms and the cognitive impairment tend to not be touched by health so when it comes to um NDIS then there's sort of a clear difference there to be like this person's managed by health um, in these ways. So so with these symptoms, but these symptoms or th this impact is still very profound and significant and there's nothing that health can do. So then they that is called a psychosocial disability in, in NDIS world and they can meet access for that. Um, they've still got the diagnosis of, of schizophrenia and so they haven't necessarily met access for schizophrenia, but it's the schizophrenia diagnosis that has um, meant that they have the, the profound impact which has resulted in the psychosocial disability. So when speaking in the report, you can either say schizophrenia or psychosocial disability. It's completely up to you, um, but just make sure that they have met access for psychosocial disability because a lot of people, they say that they have and they haven't. So, and it can be a tricky one. Um, if a person, if you're finding as well, um, and I'm going off on a lot of tangents, sorry, but if you um, find a person is, um, is like when you, when you do an assessment, and this is more to the clinicians, when you do an assessment, or even if you get that feedback um, from your person or from the clinician um, that they have assessed, but the main concerns that they have are linked to a diagnosis that they haven't met access for, um, the individual can go back through access um, to gain access for that disability as well using that assessment report. So it's just a conversation that you need to have to let them know that that's sort of what they need to do as a step before, um, but it's definitely possible. So um, as long as it's you know, most appropriately, like as long as they meet the eligibility criteria for that one as well, um, they can have um, more than one diagnosis that is recognised. Um, so just a, a summary um, before we go on to the last little bit um, is that I encourage using the six domains um, as a guide through an assessment report um, when speaking about functional impact, ensure that the statement uh, it, of what the individual cannot do is followed up by examples of what that looks like um, and what support looks like and the risk of it not being provided. Um, so ensure that the statements made um, uh, of what the individual cannot do is backed up by evidence of an assessment tool, either standardised or non-standardised, um, and ensuring that the information, I know I've said it a couple of times in, in the section, in the middle section, um, is building a picture um, and understanding. So when the recommendations are made, it makes sense to the LAC, LAC or planner, uh, and they have an understanding of the challenges. And that's really what NDIS language means. So it means not using the medical language or, or if you're going to use a medical term, explaining that in a functional way, breaking that down, what that looks like, backing it up with assessment tools. Um, yeah, building a picture. What should be avoided when it comes to providing evidence to the NDIS? Don't focus on what the individual can do. The exception there being what I said before around a summary report is you want to kind of have some evidence around how 
the support that you've been providing is working, but that it needs to continue because there are still gaps. There are still challenges. Avoid medical language um, like treatment, especially in the recommendation section. Do not ever use the word treatment because they will see that as health responsibility. Um, and ensuring evidence in the report links back to the person's disability. Uh, and, and if they're speaking about a health condition, document how it relates back to their disability or how they can functionally manage or not manage it based on their disability. So if a clinician doesn't provide sufficient evidence um, or that the report is sort of off in terms of it's not speaking in functional language and it's not the recommendations aren't relating to reasonable and necessary, if you have a support coordinator or a recovery coach, um, then part of their role is to assist with providing feedback to the clinician to ensure that the report or letter is in line with the NDIS and what they expect. Um, and the support coordinator can help uh, build the capacity to provide your capacity to provide that feedback. If you don't have a support coordinator, and I know me saying you, you should feel empowered, um, but I hope that this has helped. Like this is the sort of purpose of me doing these these education sessions as well is to give information um, to people in the community about the NDIS and um, help to build capacity and help to empower you guys to be able to speak up um, and know that you have the choice, know that you can, know that this is your plan, your report. And if it doesn't make sense to you, or if you feel like something is not right, questioning it, it is okay. Like a clinician is like, yes, they have a degree in that area and they're very good at what they do, but you are the best at knowing your life. You are the best at knowing the supports that you are asking for and what you need from them. Um, and so please, I hope that you can feel empowered to be able to do that. So the last thing, and this is sort of a little bit of a wrap up summary um, before we go to questions and finish, um, is what I was saying before is the golden thread. So um, I, I said before that the golden thread essentially, and I've put a lot of words here, but essentially it means that it makes sense. So not just that report, like the, the clinical report, that it sort of builds on it through the picture builds throughout and then the recommendations, the planner or LAC will be like, yep, that totally makes sense. Um, and we uh, feel confident to put this forward to, the, to, to be approved. But it also is the the other reports, quotes, letters um, need to all back each other up. They can't and there has to be a golden thread between them. If they are contradicting, and this is really important at any stage, whether it's access or whether it's a reassessment or whether it's a change of situation, the reports that... Um, uh, you are providing and the supporting evidence that you are providing, they need to make sense to each other. If they contradict each other, the NDIA are just going to get confused and or they're going to, they're not going to fund it because they're going to say that there's insufficient or inappropriate evidence. So that's really important to make sure they all make sense. So that's what I mean by golden thread. Um, and people who I've worked with do know that term a lot because I say it a lot, but um, it's really important. And it's something I learned very early on um, and it's made a lot of sense throughout. And with the, like the NDIA, um, as a lot of people would have experienced, they are, well, they're, they're insurance scheme and they're trying to sustain the scheme. So they are, um, uh, so they're trying to cut wherever they can. So if, if we are writing strong supporting evidence reports and um, providing strong letters of support and everything makes sense, um, then it's much more likely that the participant is going to get the support that they need. Uh, it's never guaranteed, um, but there's a much better chance of doing it. So, yes. Um, so I've, I've um, put a, a few resources here, which will be linked on the website. Um, these aren't new resources. I've uh, I've linked them to previous webinars as well, um, but they are really important. These ones mainly important when it comes to recommending. 
or recommendations, uh, but we'll also put a couple of other ones on there that helps with that middle bit of the report um, and that functional language. And like it was requested before, um, a bit of a template. So that, that is a um, choice, of course, uh, but it will just show, I guess, what needs to be covered in the most important bits in a um, assessment report and in a summary report that the NDIA are really focused on. Because it doesn't need to be pages and pages and pages long. Often they are long, but it's more that it has the correct information in it. Um, so we can finish off the last couple of minutes with any questions. Ali, is there any questions in the chat? Hi, thanks, Alex. Yeah, we've had three questions come through the chat. Yeah. Um, one of them I'll start off with because it might be quite a quite a quick one. Um, mm -hmm. Rando was asking when you mentioned don't ever use the word treatment, mm -hmm. and what are some good words to use? So he suggested intervention. Is that acceptable? Um, so intervention better yes um i would say that uh steering clear of anything that is that is sort of on that like early intervention sort of uh, intervention can sort of be also seen as that health responsibility so essentially what we want the recommendation to focus on is that is the particular skill that they that they are focused that they're going to focus on building capacity in? Um, so building capacity in, um, yeah. If if you use the word building capacity rather than treatment, so I also want to make it really clear that the summary report at the end, yes, that's going to get a, give a bit of detail. But what a person does in each of the session, the NDIA don't have access to that. So if it is more treatment that you're doing, but treatment, I mean things like CBT or DBT or ECT, those psychological treatments. Um, that are clearly health. Um, that's what they hear when they hear the word treatment or intervention is is probably potentially acceptable, but a potentially a bit sort of, but if you're saying that you're building capacity, um, then that is much more acceptable. Um, and that's the way the NGIA want to hear it because they are a capacity building scheme. Thank you. And then the other questions came from Eric and Tracy, who have had similar experiences. So um, Eric was asking, um, he says, I've been waiting and collating reports for my son to the NDIA um, since its inception. Um, and even if things change, for example, a social activity or his specialist change, um, the NDIA doesn't incorporate the changes. They just keep repeating the previous report. So how can we get them to read the documents we've provided? Mm -hmm. Um, and then Tracy has added to that, saying I have the same problem, um, even with the LAC not updating personal information or information around capacity. So can we request what the LAC is submitting? Absolutely. So um, I would... Uh, so what I might actually share as well is a little bit of a template that you can use um, when you're preparing for a... Um, plan reassessment and so it's just a sort of it doesn't need it's not anything formal but I guess it helps um, it helps you to then um, share that with the NDIA or share that with the LAC or planner so it's there in writing I find when things are in writing it's much better than when you verbally say it because I feel like so much is missed whereas when you if it's in writing and they go back through the notes and back through the things then they can copy and paste it if it's clearly sort of um there's clear headings and everything as well. I think that helps too. Um, in terms of getting people to read it, if you're finding that people aren't reading your reports, that is wrong. And I know it happens. I'm, I 100% know it happens. But every time it happens, I always put in feedback um, to feedback at NDIS. And part of their service charter is they have to respond to it. So if you're feeling like um, an LAC in particular or a planner hasn't read the report, you can request another planner or LAC and redo the meeting which I know is painful but you can do that um, or you can request you can put in feedback um, and say these things have not been addressed and I've requested that these are changed um, unfortunately there's yeah there's it's a a system thing can happen as well but I think there's a lot of people working in different areas and I think things can get lost um, misinterpreted really easily 
but I find that if it's clearly outlined and clearly there's clear headings and if it's in writing, um, it can help. Um, but if you're finding that you're not being heard or that things in writing aren't being read or responded to, then 100% put feedback in because they need to then correct it. Um, yeah. But it's not a... It's 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 something that's hard to change with the scheme, but it's um it's definitely something that if we keep speaking about it, hopefully there will be that change from a systemic level. Hopefully, um, yes. Thanks, Alex. That's all oh, right. Jenny's just added. Can we share your plan review template or your um, report um, uh, template with clients? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's sort of just a guide. We'll add it on as like a Word doc. And so you guys can make changes and make it your own. Um, but it's just a guide as to what I've sort of picked up over the years as being really helpful to speak to. Um, uh, and yeah, so um, I, but I'll, we'll put it as a Word doc so you guys can change, chop and change it. But yeah, you can share it with whoever. Great. Thank you. Um, Thanks everybody for coming. And uh, I next month, what are we doing next month, Ali? Next month we are. Is it supported independent living? It is supported independent living next month. So we're talking about housing, which is a big topic again, um, but the focus will mainly be on supported independent living. Um, but we will touch on the other housing models and also all the changes within um the housing space because soon there's not going to be such thing as supported independent living. Um, so uh, we will be speaking about that. But yeah, thank you everyone for joining. And um, I'm going to make sure that I stop share, stop recording now, I mean.